Now this is where you can turn to your text in Psalm 40. And I want to read a few verses and then we're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessings on the service. And at the same time, we're going to pray for uh, these missionaries that I have mentioned to you tonight. But Psalm 40. Psalm 40. And once you find your place in Psalm 40, if you're willing and able to stand together tonight, I want to consider these first three verses. And I'm sure these are verses that you're familiar with and acquainted with. The Lord has a message for us tonight, and I'm thankful that he always does. Psalm 40, the psalmist, verse number one, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord and shall trust in the Lord. Brother Mike, would you pray for us tonight and these missionaries as well? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When you look in your Bibles tonight and you find the heading, Psalm 40, and then right down below that is a subscription telling us that this is a Psalm of David. Now, we know that David, no doubt, through his years of following the Lord and serving the Lord, that he learned some uh, many precious and valuable lessons about his Lord and his Savior. And as David said, that his shepherd, my shepherd, uh, we find him from a young shepherd boy all the way up through the stages of life and see the ups and downs in his life. And even though David hadn't always been faithful, we've seen the demonstration that God always was and always will be. Uh, the, some of the lessons that David learned that God shares with us in his word and, and uh, things that are written in regards to David. And then he allows David to pick up the pen and begin to write in some of the Psalms. And David shares with us some situations that he is faced with and going through. But I'm sure that David learned uh, uh, that regardless of whatever comes about in life, that God is still able to give victory. Regardless of how big that your giant may be, whatever the giant may consist of, a sickness or financial or spiritual or mental or whatever, no matter how big your giant is, David would testify that our God is bigger, that he's seen that uh, the Lord give victory. Uh, the, the lion and the bear and Saul and Absalom and on and on and on that God delivered and gave victory. He learned that God is omniscient, that he's not only omnipotent, that he has all power both in heaven and in earth, but God is omniscient, that he knows all things. He knows all things that took place yesterday. He knows what's going on today in our lives. He knows what will take place tomorrow. And really what David says is no matter where I go, I can't get away from him, that God's already there. And he says God knows all things. God knows what goes on behind closed doors. And now David would testify tonight that not only does God know about sin, but God will deal with you about your sin. When he sent uh, down there and, and the parable was given and the Lord had him say that you are the man, you're the one that's responsible that these verses are, have been written about, uh, that he learned sin was costly. Uh, that he would testify tonight that God is full of mercy and grace and he's full of forgiveness and compassion and and God will restore those that will repent and confess their sin that God is faithful to do just that uh, but at the same time that there comes consequences with sin and David had to deal with some things in his life even after he was restored and forgiven because of things that were put into motion now when we read Psalm 40 tonight there's been a uh, discussion I don't like to use the word debate but there's been a, a discussion as to the uh, uh, context of this psalm, uh, when it was written, we know who wrote it, that David wrote it as God had used him to do so, uh, but we don't really know what is the context, what was going on in David's life during this time. 
Uh, some have said, well, we believe that it was when David was fleeing from one of his enemies, whether it be Saul or Absalom, and David uh, was uh, at times that he was isolated from others and cut off, and, and he uh, was uh, in a place of utter dependence upon the Lord. And there's others that have come up with their ideas and opinions. The truth is tonight that we really just don't know. Uh, but I'm glad sometimes that those details are not given because they're not given those details that we find that it can be applied in so many different positions. Whenever Paul said that he had a thorn in the flesh, I'm thankful that he didn't identify what his thorn was because had it been eyesight or whatever it might have been, that we would think, well, God has grace that's sufficient if you've got bad eyesight or if you've got this or this or this. But since David didn't, or since Saul or Paul didn't identify what his thorn in the flesh was, uh, that we know tonight, regardless of what you're going through, thank God his grace is sufficient and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So sometimes when a, a certain details are left out, it's to our benefit and for our good. Uh, when we uh, think about this psalm that uh, I've heard many people use this psalm as a, uh, a testimony as to David's salvation, David's personal testimony, uh, that it speaks about being in a horrible pit, and, and that's speaking of the dark despair of sin before salvation, sinking deeper and deeper. Uh, speak of how that we were in a terrible situation and unable to help ourselves. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were and ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Dead man can't do anything to help themselves. A dead man can't do anything to initiate salvation or deliverance. Uh, have to wait on God to show up. They point to the fact here in verse number 2 uh, that God is the deliverer. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the merry clay, set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Uh, I agree that we were in a mess. For salvation sinners, and we were condemned. We were declared guilty uh, before God uh, that we needed to be justified. And thank God we have been justified through salvation, declared not guilty. And the Word of God says there's therefore uh, no condemnation. I'm glad that we're not under condemnation and wrath, that we have been forgiven. But when we were before salvation in our sinful state, uh, that we were not only condemned, but no matter what was tried, that there wasn't one thing that we could do to save ourselves. Uh, we meet folk all the time that are engaged in religion, and religion says if you do this and this and this and this, that once you get to a certain level, uh, that God will uh, uh, forgive you and God will accept you as you are. Uh, but we know that's not true because there's not anything good that we can do. Uh, that, uh, that we're not saved by the works of ri our righteousness, but we're saved by his righteousness that is imputed unto us. Uh, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you and I could have earned it, Jesus would have died in vain, but we couldn't earn it, and therefore we needed a Savior, and Jesus came to be uh, just that. Uh, we understand that God, uh, in uh, his love and grace, brought to us one day a message of hope and salvation and deliverance. Uh, we understand that whenever we couldn't come to him and couldn't get to him, that he came to us. As David says, he brought us up and brought us out, uh, saved us from an eternal hell. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean this lightly, and please don't take it lightly, but in a literal sense, did you know that you and I will never feel the flames of hell? And the Word of God tells us that they're real and they're intense. Uh, we'll never be in that position desiring one drop of water be placed upon our tongues. We'll never hear the horrible cries and screams that come from hell from those that have rejected Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll never feel that, uh, uh, that isolation and distance between us and God because we've been saved and delivered. Uh, I, I heard a song one time, Thank God I'm Not Going to Hell. That was a song. And I heard it and I thought, what kind of... But the more I listened to it and the more I started thinking... Thank God, I'm not going to hell. Uh, they can't nobody send me there. No matter what I do, I can't mess up enough to be rejected and thrown out and cast out and, and rejected of God. I've been sealed into the day of redemption, saved by His marvelous grace. And from this point on, I don't ever, 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 ever have to fear hell because it was settled the day that I came to Jesus for salvation and He saved my soul. Now, my, my fear today is for those that don't know Jesus and those that don't understand the reality of hell. But I don't have to fear hell. I've been saved from hell. But thank God I've been secured for heaven. 
And one of these days, we're going to be in a land that's fairer than day. And the songwriter says, by faith, we can see it afar. Uh, in a place where the street of gold and, and a place where uh, there's uh, pearly gates and there's walls of jasper, most importantly than that, that there's a throne and there on the throne is our Lord and Savior who is worthy to open the books and he's worthy. Uh, he's a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world but is as the line of the tribe of Judah that hath prevailed and thank God he's alive forevermore. That's our Lord and Savior tonight and one of these days we'll see him. But I realize that the Lord has given us peace and joy. He's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust him. Uh, we had a, a friend years ago that he's in heaven now. Miss Teresa and I was friends of the family. Uh, but Brother Tom had came to Bible college. And uh, Brother Tom had shared his testimony as to uh, what had happened in his life earlier. About how he was... Uh, in the depths of sin and he shared with us details that when you see him you'd say how in the world could God bring somebody from so low place in life uh, to where he is today but uh, he would tell you that he would tell you things that went on in the home and things went on outside the home and was ashamed of it and uh, he said my dear wife that she put up with it and she well, was faithful and she went to church and said she prayed and prayed and prayed and said everybody was telling her that I'll never change that the best thing she could do is pack her bags and leave and she said that I knew he wouldn't change on his own but I knew God could change him and she said I kept praying and praying and praying and he said thank God she prayed he said the more she prayed the worse I got he said but it come to a place where God broke me down and God broke him down, and God saved his soul, and God changed him, and God called him to preach, and God sent him back to the uh, community where he was involved in all the stuff, and uh, took him and, and used him to establish a church there. And it was in that church uh, during a revival meeting that uh, where I surrendered the call to preach. Uh, we was up there, and my pastor was preaching, and we was helping out with the meeting, and it was there that God helped me get established in my heart. And I thought, here uh, is a preacher that uh, used to be in the depths of sin, but God God delivered him now a pastor in a church a church where God's working and moving a church where the Holy Spirit had liberty to deal with me about what he wanted for my future I tell you this God can do whatever he wants but I remember in some of the services that Lord move in and, and, and just be an element of liberty and excitement and uh, brother Tom would say pastor Lockie I don't mean to interrupt the service but I just got to share my testimony and he would always go to this psalm and he'd say I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry he brought me up also out of an horrible pit out of the merry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings he hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord and he'd say that's what God did for me Amen. now I say that's what God did for me as well right. and some approach this as a personal testimony of David and, and there's nothing wrong with that because when you get from verse 2 down it is a picture of what's happened a salvation uh, but uh, tonight I'd like to take just a little bit different approach now when I say different approach I'm not talking about taking anything out of context I'm not about talking about changing and twisting God's word around but I'm talking about looking at it from a literal perspective uh, I agree tonight that we were in a mess wouldn't you agree with that I agree tonight that God did save us, bless his holy name. I do agree tonight that not one thing that you and I could do uh, would ever have canceled out one sin. I do agree tonight it's all by God's grace. But I want you to notice right quick, verse number one, the wording of this text. Verse number one, the psalmist begins by saying, I waited patiently for the Lord. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord for the Lord he said I waited patiently for him to deliver me from the situation that I was in now when I think about this tonight I don't know how it was for you but whenever I was lost I didn't even know I was lost until God showed me I was lost as you know tonight you can't be found till first of all you're lost uh, you can't be saved till you understand you're lost uh, that uh, the song says I'm glad that I uh, was lost or so uh, glad that I got lost so I could be found I'm glad that God showed me I was a lost sinner one day. That wasn't a pretty picture, but God didn't leave me in that position, and neither did he you, that I realized that. But when I was lost, I didn't know I needed to be saved until it was through the preaching of God's word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And when the word of God was preached, 
And I understood through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Word that I was a lost sinner in need of a Savior. I understood by the preaching of God's Word that there wasn't one thing that I could do to deliver myself. I couldn't right my wrongs. I couldn't straighten up what was all uh, mixed up. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't. The only thing that I could do is to bring it to Jesus. And I understood through the preaching of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit that if I came to Jesus and asked Him to forgive me, that He would save me, that He would in no wise cast me out, and that if I called upon His name, that I shall and should be saved, would be saved. And I was saved, thank God. And I'm still saved today, and I'll be saved tomorrow and the next day as well. But I realize, in reality, I wasn't waiting patiently for God to come and deliver me. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even looking for God. Matter of fact, I hadn't cried out to God and asked Him to deliver me. Had I had done that, that first of all, I had to be convicted before I'd ever call out to Him. And once I called out to Him, I didn't have to wait on Him to answer. When I called out to Him for salvation, thank God He was right there. And when I asked Him to save me, He didn't say, I'll do it next week or next month. Thank God I got up off that altar different than I went down on that altar. And I was saved by His marvelous grace. And thank God for the liberty that I felt. It's instant. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not progressive. It's not a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow. It happened right then, right there, uh, June of 1980 at West North Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. I remember it just like it was yesterday. But I wasn't waiting on God. I wasn't praying for God to come and deliver me. But here's what happened. I believe that it was God who was calling out to me. Aren't you glad for the day that he spoke to your heart and he called out unto you? Just like when he said, Lazarus, come forth. That Sunday morning, he may not have spoke to another soul, West Lord Baptist Church, but there wasn't any doubt in my mind God was speaking to my heart. And he knew I needed to be saved. And I couldn't get away from it. But it was God that spoke to me. It was him that pled with my heart. And I wasn't waiting patiently on him, but on the other hand, he and his mercy and grace and long-suffering was waiting patiently on me. You know, that first Sunday morning, God spoke to my heart. I didn't go to the altar and get saved that morning. I should have, but I didn't. It's amazing what little things will hold a person back from the greatest victory that they could ever receive in life. I've asked people before, do you believe that you're a sinner? Oh, yes. You believe Jesus died for your sin? Oh, yes. You believe if you ask Jesus to come in your heart that he'll save you and forgive you for sin? Oh, yes. Uh, do you believe that he'll do it right now? Oh, yes. Would you like to get it settled? Well, not today. What in the world in your life is so important that you'd be willing to go to hell over? What's holding you back? What's the hindrance? For me as that young boy, it was the simple fact that I was timid and bashful and embarrassed. And the whole thing that I was struggling with was I didn't want to get up in front of everybody. It's amazing how the devil can use such trivial things to keep us from the most important things in life. But you know, that's not just the case for salvation. Sometimes it's service. That God's dealing with a person about serving him in a certain capacity. And you say, well, I would and I want to, but there's a reservation. Moses had reservation. Jeremiah had re Others had reservation. Uh, but uh, I tell you this, God knows what he's doing whenever he speaks to our heart. But uh, the Lord waited patiently for me and he gave me another opportunity. Thank God he didn't have to, but he did. And it was in his mercy and grace that he waited on me. And so when I look at this psalm and I read from verse 2 down, I say this is a, a testimony of salvation. But it's not just a testimony of salvation when you take verse 1 all the way down. It is a testimony of deliverance for one who already belongs to God. And why is that important? Because you and I need deliverance from time to time. There's a whole lot of things that could come in our life, regardless of what some may say, that whenever you and I got saved, we didn't become sinless. You ever met uh, that crowd that thinks that they're no longer, they're no longer sinners? I know that I'm a sinner. As a matter of fact, when you read in 1 John, he tells you if you say you have no sin, that, uh, that uh, the truth's not in you, that, that uh, there's the, we deal with sins of omission, sins of commission, and, and there's so many things that we deal with. We're not sinless, but we should strive to sin less. But regardless of our efforts and desires that we fail God from time to time, and, and there's times that we fall, there's times we get off course, and I believe by the wording of this psalm that it could very possibly be a time in David's life when David had got out of step with God on his Christian journey. 
Now, I'm not disregarding. It could have been when he was fleeing from Saul. It could have been when he was running from Absalom. But I, I think tonight that it very possibly could have been a time in David's life when he got mixed up and messed up spiritually. Uh, if you've read much about David's life, you know that it happened in David's life on more than one occasion. David found himself asking God for restoration and forgiveness. Notice in verse number 12, when you read on through this psalm, there's a lot of things. He does talk about the enemies. Uh, but verse number 12, he said, For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Notice what it says. Mine iniquities, talking about his sin, Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Then in verse 13 he says, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Sound to me like there's a very good possibility that this is in a time of spiritual drought in David's life. As a result of maybe David having gotten off course that he found himself uh, in a fallen position and sinking deeper and deeper and the harder he tried to get out, the deeper that he got. In other words, his efforts to help himself only made things worse. But I think we can all can relate to this that you know that it's real easy in spite of our greatest desires and best efforts. It's so easy to get distracted spiritually and get off course. And sometimes all we have to do is, uh, even unacknowledgedly, that we maybe put things before the Lord. And there's times that we uh, may allow sin to come in our lives that we spoke about this morning. Uh, there's times that we uh, have those sins of uh, omission and we fail to give God thanksgiving as we're supposed to. We fail to give God praise and glory. We fail to, to, to witness and testify as we should. And uh, there's times we get away from Bible study and prayer and we find ourselves in a spiritual drought. And before you know it, you're awakened to the fact that something's happened in my life, that I'm not as close to the Lord as I was one time. And I feel distant. And when I pray, I feel like my prayers are not being heard. And I read the Word of God. And used to it jumped off the pages, would jump off. And, and things stand out. And I can read it now. And I'm not seeing anything. And I'm in spiritual trouble. And I'm dried up. And I need some help. And I believe that that very well could have been what was going on in David's life. When he said, I'm in a horrible pit. And he says, be pleased, O Lord, deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help in trouble. Uh, fellowship disrupted. When David realized he was in trouble, David did the best thing he could do. That he knew where his help would come from. And regardless if it was a spiritual trouble or whether it was a, uh, the threat of those on his trail, regardless that David was in a position that he needed help and he knew where his help would come from. But I don't know how it is for you, but times in my life when I have failed the Lord and I've made a mistake, and I've done something wrong, and I've made a foolish choice on my own without consulting the Lord about it, and did something. Those have been the hardest times in my life to come to the Lord and ask Him to forgive. You say, why, preacher? You don't think He will? Yes, I do. But I'm ashamed to. Ashamed to. Just like I've told you before, that I love my dad and mom and have a, have had a close relationship to them. And I was always excited to see dad and mom come home until there was something wrong on my end. I got a report card with F's on it, and I'm not excited to see dad and mom today. Why? Because there's a problem on my end. Something happened here. Something happened. I broke something I wasn't supposed to be messing with. I've done this and done that. I wasn't excited. Why? Because I was ashamed. My dad knew whenever he pulled up, if I didn't run up to greet him, that he better find out what's going on. He knew. And as parents, we've seen it happen too. Whenever I, I used to come home from work sometime, the kids would scatter. <laughs> you know why? Because they knew that they, daddy was going to get them when he got home. Really, daddy didn't have to because mama done got him. I don't know how many times. And she, she disciplined. But you know what I'm saying? There's the old saying, if you make your bed, you need to lie in it. And that might be true as far as worldly things are concerned, but in spiritual terms, that's not God's will. There's times we said, I got myself in this mess, and therefore I've got to get myself out of it. 
You ever found yourself in a mess and you tried and tried and tried, and the more you tried to dig yourself out, the deeper it got? Well, I'm telling you, I've been there so many times. And you know why we didn't get out? It's because the Lord didn't allow us to get out. You know why he didn't allow us to get out on our own? It's because he wanted us to understand that he loves us and cares about us and that he is not only able, but he's willing to deliver and willing to restore. He wanted us to cry out unto him and be dependent. Uh, that uh, David cried out unto the Lord. And notice, uh, whenever he cried out, thank God, when we cry, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. But David said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. When he's speaking about waiting patiently, uh, that uh, notice that God didn't immediately respond. When I find myself in a mess, regardless if it's taken a long time to get in that mess or if it just happened, when I find myself in a mess, I want out of it as quick as I can get out of it. I want God to show up as quick as I call upon his name, and I want it over and gone, but sometimes it don't happen that quickly. You know why? Because the Lord wants us to understand that this could happen again. And sometimes he leaves us there for a little while so we don't make the same mistake. I took and my, uh, my uncle came down from somewhere, uh, Georgia, somewhere one time, and he was driving a motor home. And uh, I got in there, and my grandpa and some of us, and we was looking around, and I seen a pair of handcuffs on the console. And he had been, I think, in law enforcement. And, buddy, I couldn't stand it. I went over there, and I started messing. I shouldn't have been messing with them. But I took, and I got those handcuffs, and I put my hands behind my back, and I had managed to get them cuffed. And I went over there, and I went to him, and I said, uh, I need some help here. He said, oh, my goodness. He said, I don't have the key. It's back in Georgia. I said, it's in Georgia. I said, well, get the saw. Daddy said, you can't saw through them. They're too hard of metal. And uh, he said, you'll have to wear them. And I, he let me wear them for half the night. And then finally pulled out a key and unhooked them. I'll tell you this. It, it might have been humorous, but I guarantee you I never put another pair of handcuffs on. <laughs> hey, Amen. I wouldn't even put them on if you're standing there with a key in your hand. I don't ever want to be in handcuffs again. But sometimes we're left in those situations so that we can learn and we don't get back to it. But we, we don't like to wait. We want to, to be instant. It's hard to wait. I mean, after all, isn't life uh, so fast-paced that we have everything's instant, instant coffee, instant grits? Uh, we got a microwave. You put your food in there and put two or three minutes and boom, it's gone. It's done. It's ready. Uh, fast food restaurants, we've got, uh, we don't even have to get up and change the channel on our TV. All we have to do is take a remote control. Everything is so fast-paced. Everything is at our fingertips except for God and he's not in our hand but we're in his hand he's not operating according to our time but we're operating according to his time but there's benefits in praying to God there's benefits in waiting on God there's benefits tonight uh, in trusting in God we find verse number two that God lifted David from his despair and verse number two that God put him on a, a firm standing he put his feet upon a rock and verse number uh, three, that God, verse uh, two, God uh, put him back on the right course, established his goings. And verse number three, God gave him joy and praise, put a, a song in, uh, upon his lips and his mouth. And, and we, we find all these wonderful things uh, that really when we look at this psalm that we find David's patience, his waiting. We find David's petition. He's cried unto the Lord. We find David's position that he's in a bad position. He's in a, a, a horrible pit. We find David's pardon that God delivers him. And thank God he's delivering. We find the progression. God brings him up and brings him out and establishes his goings and puts his feet on a rock. We find David's praise. Notice right quick, David's praise. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Do you know praise is important tonight? And when it comes to this praise, the origin of this praise, David says it's him. He hath put, he hath put a new song. He said, he hath put a new song in my mouth. I wonder what the song was. Do you know the Bible tells us that when we get to heaven, we're going to sing a new song. I don't know what it's going to be, but I just believe in my heart it's going to be a song of deliverance and praising the Lord. Do you know the angels can sing, but the angels can't, they can't sing about redemption and deliverance. That's something they don't know anything about. 
They have to stand on the sidelines and watch us. They can praise God, but when it comes to deliverance and redemption, that it's our duty, and it should be our desire to praise the Lord. But I, I don't know what David's song was, but this morning whenever uh, Brother Jerry had us to go to 341, and we knew when he turned to 341 uh, what that song was, Victory in Jesus. Uh, that could have possibly, uh, I'm sure it wasn't this song, but the, the uh, concept of it. I was looking at this song, a song tonight in uh, the second uh, stanza, uh, and uh, it says, uh, How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. Uh, he heard about that. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me to me, the victory. That's exciting. David said, I called unto him. He inclined unto me, heard my cry, and he came and brought the, the victory, a new song that God's worthy of our praise, uh, the object of our praise. Uh, not only do we find the origin that it's he hath, it's God's put this new song in our mouth, even praise unto our God. He is the object of our praise. It's him that saved us. It's him that's redeemed us. It's him that delivered us. And he's worthy to not to be praised. Now notice there's a purpose right quick in the latter part of verse number three. The word of God says many shall see it. You know what that means? It means our praise ought to be visible and ought to be vocal. Somebody said don't just say it but show it. Our life ought to be a demonstration of thanksgiving unto God. We can say we thank God, but Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we say we love God, if we love him, we'll have a desire to keep his commandments. But many shall see it and fear. And then there's the value of praise. Praise is not only should be visible, but praise is valuable. It says many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Now, isn't that our desire tonight? is to see sinners saved. So the question tonight is, what is the context of this song? Was it when David was fleeing from one of his enemies? Uh, was it uh, when David uh, had uh, found a sin in his life and needed to be dealt with? I don't know tonight, but I will tell you this. Regardless of what's going on, that this is a psalm of hope for the waiting ones. Might be somebody in here tonight and you're waiting on something to be different in your life. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord in a hopeless, helpless situation. Maybe tonight you have a physical need and you're praying because you know God can deliver and you're waiting on God to do something that only God can do. You ever waited on God because of a financial need? Sure. You ever had a financial need because of poor decisions? Because of poor, poor stewardship? Because uh, I done something because I wanted it. I didn't mention it this morning, but you know, uh, back in 1980, that Nancy Reagan, that she had launched a campaign against the war on drugs. And uh, she came out with a slogan, and the slogan is, just say no. Just say no. But you know, eight years later, in 1988, Nike came out with a new pair of shoes, and they were these fancy high-dollar shoes. And their slogan is, just do it. Just do it. They, they say, when you look at these shoes and you say, I want those shoes, but I know I can't afford them, uh, don't worry about it. Just buy them anyway. And really what it comes down to, that's where life is today. And many people, are, uh, they say, I, I don't know, but if it feels good, just do it. If it makes you happy, just do it. Don't worry about the consequences, just do it. That's what I preached against this morning. Uh, but when we think about times that we just did it and we ended up in a mess and we started crying for God for him to deliver. What about tonight, those that's in a spiritual drought, crying and waiting on God to restore and give revival? This psalm is a psalm of hope for the waiting ones, but it's a psalm of hope for the wounded ones. When David said he was in a horrible pit, the word pit speaks about a cistern or dungeon, something that's down. And he speaks about being trapped, speaks about being in a place where there's no way out. Uh, no matter what you try, that you're, uh, you can't get out on your own. Been there before many times. It's a psalm of hope, not only for the waiting ones and the wounded ones, but for the wretched ones. When David cried out, 
Uh, verse 1 says, God inclined. You know what that means? That means to stretch down, to bend down. And when David couldn't get to God, God showed up where David was. I praise the Lord for that. Think about this tonight. I'm going to close with this. The psalmist said that he brought me up, also out. Do you know there's more to just bringing one up? Let me give you an illustration. When Peter was out there and he said, Lord, bid me come to thee. And the Lord said, come. And Peter was the only one that had faith enough to get out of the boat. And we don't want to criticize Peter for that. He's the only one who was able to walk on the water. But he started walking on the water and then he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. Peter was sinking quick. I don't know if he knew how to, well, I guess he knew how to swim because later on we find him swimming to shore where Jesus was. But in that moment of despair, uh, he, he felt hopeless and helpless and he's sinking down. You know what he said? He didn't go in some big, long, lengthy prayer. He said, Lord, save me. And before he could get the words out of his lips, he found a hand reaching down farther than he could reach up. Did you know there's the grace of the power of God's deliverance? And I thank God that he touches us and God heals us and God helps us. But he, he brought him up. Now, if Jesus had simply brought Peter up and got him on top of the water and said, okay, now you're up and let him go, he'd have went right back down. He could have picked him up, down, up, down, up, down, but no, Jesus didn't just pick him up out of the water or pick him up, but he brought him out. And I believe he put him back in that boat. Do you know, I believe tonight that God desires to deliver. But when we really trust the Lord, he's not just going to pick us up and let us drop right back into it. God said, I want to bring you up, but I want to bring you out. I don't want you to be bound by this any longer. I don't want you to have to deal with it any longer. The grace of his touch brought him out. Uh, I read this one time. It said there was a legalist that came by and saw a sinner down in the pit. And uh, he stopped and he preached a five-point message on the dangers of the pit. Didn't help the guy one bit. Then later on, there was a religionist that came by. And religion is man trying to get to God by his own efforts. And he stopped and he said, I want to give you... A, Ten steps on how to get out of the pit on your own. And then I want to give you ten steps on how to stay out of the pit on your own. That's no good because you can't get out on your own. And if you get out on your own, you probably can't stay out on your own. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. The pessimist comes along and said, I hate to tell you, but you're never going to get out of that pit. You're going to die in that pit. There's no hope for you and there's no help from you. No hope, no help. That's a lie when it comes to the things of God. The optimist comes along and said, uh, I agree, that's a pit, but I've seen a lot worse. It's not that bad. Then comes along the realist and says, you just need to accept the fact that you're in a pit. But then lastly, Jesus comes along and says, you're in a pit. And I'm not just going to bring you up and out, but I'm going to come to where you are. And I'm going to take a hold of you and I'm going to deliver you. You say, How do you, why do you say that? Because that's what Jesus did when he saved my soul. He didn't just stay in heaven and reach down and pull us out of sin. Jesus said, you need to be delivered. I'm going to have to get down where you are. And I'm going to have to become what you are. And I'm going to have to robe myself in human flesh. And I'm going to have to be mocked and ridiculed and rejected by men. And I'm going to have to go to that cross and bear the sin of mankind and I'm going to die for that sin and pay the penalty that you can't pay for yourself so that I can deliver you. And I'm going to be resurrected on that third and glorious day. And I'm going to tell you this morning, the reason we're saved or this night, the reason we're saved is not because of what we've done. It's because of what Jesus did. And he brought us up. And thank God he brought us out. And not only did he deliver us in salvation, but he's still delivering us over and over and over again. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying tonight. Just keep trusting in the Lord. Keep trusting in Him. Let's all stand together.